Daniel, there's a video. It's not playing. Look at it. Um, it was this morning. Can I try? Why don't you go back a couple, please? Okay, now try it. Well, I apologize. We had a, a video that I worked this morning. Let's go ahead. James Walker, in his uh, book, Husbands Who Won't Lead and Wives Who Won't Follow, wrote these words. Deep within each man and woman is a common longing, the desire to find comfort, companionship, and fulfillment. And I concur with that statement. Regardless of you know what gender we are, our age, we all we all share the same needs. We all have the need to be loved. We have a need to be accepted. We have the need to be affirmed. For the most part, most of us at some point in our pilgrimage on planet Earth have or shall experience the awful ache of not being wanted in various ways. As a matter of fact, it affects us all. We hunger for an unconditional love affair, not based on lust, no, but on love. We long for an unqualified acceptance. It's not based on our perfect performance, we all fall short of that, nor on what has been done lately for the other party. And we crave an unreserved affirmation, not based on merit, but on mercy. We all desire to find comfort. We all desire to find companionship. We all desire to find fulfillment. Go ahead. Yeah, we need me. Well, let's, we'll, we'll go ahead and let it go now. Daniel. Right. But the scary part about reality is that there are scores of human personalities like the young lady that I was going to have in a video that are not wanted. Go ahead and play it. looked at the outward appearance, but the Lord looked at the heart. I grew up in Dallas, Texas, living with my parents and my three younger brothers. I am blessed that I was raised by godly parents who took me to church from the time I was a baby. They taught me about God at home, too, and encouraged me to learn my Sunday school memory verses every week. I was born in April of 1975 with the condition known as Golden Heart Syndrome. It affects people in different ways, but it causes cardiovascular deformities. In my case, I was born without a right ear, loathed, or thumb. In addition, I am missing some of the bones on the right side of my face, including my right jawbone. I was born with a cleft lip and a cleft palate. I was also born with a hole between the top two chambers of the heart. Sometimes it still hurts to be different. It hurts when people laugh at me or make fun of me. Many people are unsure of how to treat me and they feel uncomfortable around me. Sometimes we tend to think that just because people may look differently on the outside, then they must be different on the inside. I'm just as guilty of this as anyone else. However, I think that if we would all take the opportunity to get to know people as they are, we would discover that human nature and emotions are pretty much the same for everyone. 
For example, if I have a day when I can smoke like anyone, so I get up every morning and I go to work. I have errands to run. I enjoy traveling and reading, especially with my family and friends. Some people will think that they need to walk on ice around me and never laugh or have fun with me. But I'm a real person, just like everyone else. I'm very happy as the person that I am. I'm not ashamed because I know that God created me and that He loves me just the way I am. I try to be thankful for all the things He has given me. We tend to take things for granted, myself included. But the last thing I want from other people is pity because I know that I'm important to God. See, she's no different than us. She wants the same things that you and I want. Amen. She wants comfort. She wants companionship. She wants fulfillment. She wants to be accepted. But as I said, the scary part about the reality and the days and times that we are living in, and just the human race as a whole, that there are s multiple people like this young lady who just, quite frankly, are not wanted. Nobody wants to offer them comfort, companionship, or fulfillment. No one wants to offer them an unconditional love affair, an unqualified acceptance, an unreserved affirmation. The sad and scary truth is that there are people who no one wants. Let me repeat that. There are people that nobody wants. And I really don't have to labor this fact that long because you know people like this lady, maybe not the extreme deformity that she has, but they live a lonely and an isolated existence. You've heard of or seen or known children whom no couple wanted to adopt. And so they spend their entire childhood in the foster care system, for example. You've observed scores of homeless individuals who no one wants to help, many in prison have been written off as unredeemable. And so I need not argue that fact. You'll concede that fact with me. And so our text forces us to face this reality again. It introduces us to a woman that no man wanted. Her name is Leah. She's described as being wearied, as being tired, as being exhausted. She's the type of woman that no man seemingly wanted or was interested in. And she was able, though, to overcome this debilitating reputation of not being wanted. And so I wanted this morning to take a look at her, to take a look at her life. Because clearly here is there's a woman who was able to live through the degrading experience of not being wanted by a man. And although she was often tempted to retreat into, as we often do, into pity parties and isolationism, Yet she remained true to who she was and had the inner strength and expectation to wait upon the Lord. She had courage. And what then are some of the characteristics of a woman that most men do not want? Well, our text this morning from Vaitsi, and he went gives us really three characteristics, clear characteristics, of the kind of woman most men don't want. And I'm going to share them with you this morning. The first characteristic is revealed about the woman most men do not want is that those that are beauty challenged. <laughs> beauty challenged. Verse 17 from chapter 29 says, Leah's eyes were weak. But Rachel was good looking, with beautiful features. Now that word in Hebrew for weak eyes can even mean like 
the lady we saw in the video, a turn die, or maybe a cross eye. So, however we want to interpret it, Leia had a problem with her sight, with her eyesight. And this disfigurement of her eyes made her face unappealing. Not unlike the woman in our video. And this is how highlighted by the contrasting fact that Rachel was striking. She was a hottie. She was beautiful, well figured. And so the suggestion is Rachel was beautiful and shapely, but Leah was beauty challenged, unattractive, not pleasant to look upon. We might say, dare we be politically incorrect? She was ugly. She was ugly. You need to understand that Leah's self-image was rooted in her status, but not her qualities. Historically, a woman in Leah's day would not have been highly esteemed. Her birth was lightly regarded, not the same as a male child being born, but being the oldest daughter meant she was the head household servant. Yes, that was her role in life, to be the head household servant. And being a servant meant her father was expected to pay a dowry to someone, anyone, to take her off his hands. How degrading is that? He had to buy somebody to get rid of her. She had little choice in most instances and could only hope for the best and grit her teeth while the deal for her husband was settled. And being beauty challenged meant that Leah was often overlooked. A suitor would come over the house or the, the tent and see Leah and see Rachel. Are you kidding? Yeah, look me up with Rachel. That's the one I want. And then she would be, Leah would be overlooked for the more attractive Rachel. Not knowing Leah's childhood background, we can assume that she may have had the seeds of inferiority sown in her in many ways. She might have been called, I don't know, cockeyed Leah or ugly daughter of Laban. We can assume that she was probably experienced ongoing scorn from the young kids and the butt of jokes, which would have caused her to be withdrawn. Maybe she'd hide her face and figure. She'd probably walk kind of slumped over. You see that when people have esteem issues. They walk like this. You see it, don't you? Because they don't feel good about themselves. So they're always looking down. Shoulders are kind of shrugged. Their, pro their posture is always slumped over. That's probably how she walked. She'd walk upright. Like a model? No. That's, she didn't feel beautiful. You gotta learn how to cross your feet like that. You gotta cross one in front of the other. That's the model walk. Now she didn't walk that way. She didn't feel very good about herself. She was a working woman. She focused more on her responsibilities or obligations more than she did her personal appearance. appearance. She didn't spend a lot of time putting on makeup. She didn't spend a lot of time concerned about her wardrobe. She didn't spend a lot of time messing with her do. No, there's more important things to deal with. The other kids, the younger brothers, had to be taken care of and helped to be raised. And food had to be made. House where they lived had to be cleaned. And to compensate for not having beauty and a knockout figure, she made up for it in performance. She was a pleaser. That's how often people that don't have this good self-esteem, they try to earn it. They earn it by work. Work esteem. They try to serve and they work. And they try to please so they'll be accepted and loved. And that's how Leah most likely got some measure of acceptance through her work. For most women, beauty, not brains, retains its number one position throughout life, even into middle age and beyond. And I believe the reason the average woman would rather have beauty than brains is that she knows what? That men are visual. 
That's how we're made. Women are relational, men are visual. So that, that, is, that is an absolute. And so knowing that, knowing the average man does a much better job at seeing than they do at relating. Now our strength, we have to work on relationship. It doesn't come natural to us. We're often even a little bit selfish, dare I say. Now there was a hostile husband once who had mouthed off to his wife. He asked, how can you be so beautiful, so pretty, yet so dumb? Must have been a blonde. And she appropriately replied, I'm pretty so that you'll love me. I'm dumb so that I will love you. <laughs> the average woman would rather have beauty than brains because she knows the average man can see better than he can think. Many women today who carry about a negative self-image think they have little outwardly to point to. And they are attractive and competent in many respects. Because of this perfect ten society that we live in, it's as if they have never looked in the mirror or seen one of their report cards. We read in verse 17 that Leah's eyes again were weak. They were weak. See, her self-image had little to do with her looks. It was based on her God-given qualities. A negative view of yourself based on beauty rather than brains can launch you into a lifetime crusade to prove something. That you are of unlimited work. Most women carry from childhood a profoundly negative view of themselves. Most women, if you ask them, men, if they're honest, they'll tell you they're not happy with the way they look. I don't care how striking you are. I don't care if you're a drop-dead gorgeous, even that kind of woman will still not be happy with something about their appearance. They would want to change something. They're so focused on their appearance because of the culture and society that we live in. Generally, they will have a negative view of themselves, and that's based upon their beauty rather than their brains. Most because children begin quite early to interpret their elders' actions or lack of action from one point of view. It's this. What my parents say or do must somehow pivot on me and how they feel about me. See, a child's view of life, boys and girls today, a child's view of life revolves around his or her own, his or her own feelings. Their practice of seeing the hurts of others is not sufficiently developed enough to allow them to understand that people are often locked in by their own problems. Problems. Problems that were not in any way created by the child. Therefore, if a child does not get attention, for example, and affection, and there are kids like that. They're just, they're born into the world, they're in the household, they're provided for, they're maintained, they're managed. But that's where that's where it ends. They're, they're kicked out of the house to go to school. They're fed at dinner time. They clothes on them. But if they don't get any affection, if they don't get any attention, well, then they assume there's a good reason for it. There must be something wrong with me. Or mommy and daddy would love me and show me love. And because of that view, scores of women have set themselves up to what? Abuse. Abuse. Physical abuse, emotional abuse from their partners. And ladies, you've got to get to the place where your self-image is not predicated on what you see on TV. Not what is photoshopped in the magazines and airbrushed. Not predicated on models or movie stars, and the fashion fans, but what God says about you. I told this story the other day. The last day I worked my other job, I had a, a lady that she was on a, she had a, like a cane, 
and just kind of slumped over to one side. And her husband had one of those two canes. He was kind of developing a little dementia. He wasn't all quite there. He's in a hospital bed. And she wanted to get a bed that she could put next to his hospital bed because she didn't want to be out of the room. She loved her husband and she wanted, in this condition, she still wanted to be there side by side with him. So I was helping her try to find a, a mattress that would be tall enough, you know, that, and everything so she could be right there next to him. Sweet. I spent a lot of time with her and uh, looked at all her various options. And we got to talking. Uh, it was interesting. When we got up to the counter to pay, or at least attempt to pay, and uh, one of the girls made a comment about asking her if she was a Virgo. And the lady looked at her and she goes, Honey, I don't look at dead planets for information. <laughs> And so it started, she started to talk about the Lord at the counter. And uh, so after we got down at the counter, we had, I had to, she had a long way to walk, big store, we'll walk back to her car. We got to talking. And she talked about, started talking about her family. Because at times she would break out in tears because she was in such pain. Apparently she was a school bus driver and she had gotten beat up by the kids. And uh, so she got to talk about her, her children. She started bringing out pictures of her, her daughter. Yeah, she's beautiful, but she's, 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 she's on drugs now. She used to own like 10 mattress stores in Columbus, and now just it's all on drugs now. She's you know, very intelligent. But, and, uh, and then she says, yeah, you know, she started talking more about the Lord, and she, made a, she, made a, she asked me a question, which is fun. She goes, she goes, you know what the name of God is, don't you? She goes, it's Jehovah. And I says, well, I said, maybe. But I said, there's no J in Hebrew. So actually, his name is Yahweh. And she looks at me, she goes, you know that. She goes, and you know there's no J for the Son of God, Jesus, then, right? I go, yeah, Yeshua. And so she started talking about that at this stage of her life, the thing that she loved to do more, there's nothing more she loved to do than to teach about the Bible. And then she started to reminisce about the old days. Yeah, I used to own a chain of salons. I own Isley's up in Akron. She goes, I had a chain of stores. She goes, I used to used to prepare models. And she says, yeah, let me show you a picture. She pulled out a picture uh, of her maybe probably about 20 years ago. The woman was elegant. She was strikingly beautiful. I mean, it, classy clothes. Her husband, classy suit, tie. I mean, you would have never known it. Watching her wearing that flannel shirt, her hair all messed up, slumped over on a cane. You had no idea. She was a striking woman, and her children were beautiful. It's just, you could see prosperity. You could see, you could see that she was, had done well in this life. Done well. And, uh, but at this point of her life, that wasn't showing through. And the thing that I learned from that is that beauty is fleeting faster than you would believe. Oh, she was intelligent. She was a sharpie. She went on and, uh, and started talking to me about the three wise men and the three rabbis that found Yeshua and gave me a perspective on it that I had never thought of. It was, it was deep. It was in a, I, was, I, was being, I was experiencing a Bible study. You know, talking slave. She, and she was right on. It was, and this is it. And she goes, of all the things I've done in my life, of all the things that I've experienced, the greatest gratification that I receive is teaching about the word to people. And uh, she was a wonderful person. And so her integrity, who she was, was not bound up in those days gone by when she was beautiful and when she was elegant. No, that wasn't where her identity was. No, it was what she believed the Lord 
what, what she was concerned about is what she felt the Lord was thinking about her. She was more concerned about what the Lord, how he was viewing her. And God says to all of us, and to her as well, that you are beautiful and you are valuable. In fact, there's a special word for that in Hebrew. Some of you who know Hebrew will know this word, am segulah. Am segulah. Who knows what am segulah means? I bet Patty does. Am segulah. Maybe Michael knows what that is. Am segulah. Treasured possession. That's how he refers to Israel, this treasured possession. And you must realize that your beauty and value is not predicated on how, again, you look on the outside, but how you look on the inside. It's not your hairstyle, it's not whether you're whether wearing gold or putting on designer clothes, it's the hidden person of your heart who is adorned with a meek and quiet spirit, which is the sight, and the sight of God is of great value, of great worth. And so, the first characteristic of a woman most men don't want is that of being beauty challenged. The second characteristic of a woman most men don't want is that they are patient. Patience. Men are impatient. Let me suggest here that Leah was a very patient lady. I might be reading into the text a little bit, but I believe she was. I believe she was a very patient lady. She waited and waited and waited for her time to come, and perhaps all the time to see as if her time would never come. Maybe it even come and gone. The biological clock is ticking. I'm getting older. I can't be barren in this culture. That will be a sign that I'm cursed. And perhaps she watched as all the men were hitting on her sister. And how she must have felt while they stared at her, at her and were interested in her. Perhaps she overheard conversations of men discussing Rachel's beauty as we do at times, men, and her rather nice figure. But no one stopped to stare at it. Leah. No, nobody started calling her a hottie or hitting on her. But, but she waited on God. She waited on God. Verse 23 from a portion says, In the evening he took Leah, his daughter, and brought her to Yaakov, and he went in and slept with her. Pretty racy Bible stuff, isn't it? This is not family friendly, is it? Should I censor that? Should I beep? You've got to get to the place where you know that all things do indeed work together for good to them that love God. And that requires patience. Patience. For God is a way, and I should get an amen out of this, God has a way of turning things around. Amen. He has a way of taking an impossible situation and making it possible. He has a way of reversing the tide and overturning the tables like Yeshua did. He has a way of turning a curse into a blessing and a blemish into beauty. He has a way. He has a way of a stumbling block, turning it from a stumbling block into a stepping stone. That's the God that we serve. He has a way of turning weakness into strength. Do you remember last week's message? Were you awake? It's the law of contradiction. It's the law of contradiction, of turning weakness into strength. Even those things that seem to be against you or God, God can make them work in your favor. He can make them work in your favor. God is a way of granting you your heart's desire even when it looks like nobody wants you. Ask Leah. I wish we could. I wish we could ask Leah. I wish we could ask how she feels. We asked her how she, she told us how she felt. I wish we could ask Leah how she feels. She waited and waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto her and heard her cry. For you must bear in mind that Leah wasn't walking the streets like in Songs of Solomon looking for her husband. 
No, she wasn't. Because she didn't expect to ever have one. Did she want one? Sure she did. She wanted to be loved. She wanted to be appreciated. She wanted to be valued. She wanted to be desired. We all do. But she didn't think it was going to happen to her. She didn't go clubbing. She didn't hit the, all the parties. She wasn't cruising streets, hanging out. No. She wasn't hitting the internet. Leah stayed at home. She stayed at home and God brought the man to her. Look at verse 23 again. In the evening, he took Leah, his daughter, and brought her to Yaakov, and he went in and slept with her. And that is significant, brothers and sisters, because it is a man's nature. Men, it's our nature to hunt. We are hunters. I, I wish, I, 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 say, I said this before, one of the, the funny parts about what I do part-time is watching a couple walk into the furniture store. It's the last place on earth a man wants to be. I can tell you it's hysterical because it is consistent. It always happens. The man's like this. His wife is looking around. And she's like this, and he's like... You know, it's so obvious. Now, if you now here's where it changes. If it's a guy, every salesman knows. I tell you a little tip. If you had a choice of a group of customers come in, you know what the first pick is? No, of customers. If you had to pick a customer. You know what the first one you would pick? Would you pick two women? Would you pick a couple? Or would you pick a single man? Single man. Single man. You know why? Because they don't want to be there. So if they walked in there, they're going to buy and get out. <laughs> they're going to hunt it down. They're going to say, this is fine. Where do I pay? I'm gone. I can catch the game. Always go for the single guy. Every time. Every time. They're not there to be late. They're not there to shop. They're not to take in all the new fashions or styles. They need a new TV stand for the 60-inch TV they just bought, flat screen, and they got to park it on that stand, get a recliner to put in front of it, and get out. <laughs> that's, Amen. And that's how it works. We're hunters. That's what we do. That's what we do. It's our nature to be the aggressor. It's said amongst hunters, maybe you've heard this, that no rabbit jumps up from hiding, shows his little white tail, and whistles at the hunter saying, here I am, shoot me. <laughs> no, no. Man by nature, we are hunters. We like to hunt. We like to pursue. We like to find. And that's probably why Proverbs 18.22 says, he who finds a wife, Finds a great good. He has won the favor of Adonai. What does that imply? Pursuing. Looking. Going after. Hunting. That's what it says. There are differences. It's not your job, ladies, to find a man. You make yourself available, but it's the job of the man to find you. Ladies, you don't have to go looking. God has made you to be looked after. He's made you to be sought after. We're going to be telling the story here pretty soon from Purim, for Hadassah. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> and you remember this part of the story where she had already, you know, she had already uh, become the new queen, but in order to have an audience with the king, she would have to be invited in, or it would be grounds for termination. <laughs> and so, what did she do? Well, she made herself desirable, attractive, sought after. She put on her hottie look and the king invited her in. Amen? That's how women were made. 
And perhaps that's why some women find themselves in destructive relationships. You know why? Because they're looking. They're looking to get hooked up. They're trying to figure out their lives. So they say, well, he's good enough. <clears throat> Probably the best I'm going to do. So I might as well just, nobody else has come along. I'm getting to be about, you know, 40s. I better just take what's coming along here. Better grab that one. Yes, women think that way. Perhaps you did find a man. But maybe you found the wrong man. The right man is not found, sisters, in a club. He's not found in a bar. He's not found hanging out. You need to stop searching for men. Start searching for God. Seek the kingdom first, and then all your needs will be added unto you. You need to stop searching. God will cause the right man to find you if that is what you desire. And the scripture does talk about that. In order for him to find you, well, this is, you want to be found? Then you need to be in the right place. You need to be in the right place. The first right place to be in is home. You need to be home. Not clubbing. If you can't come to your house on, by your invitation, then he's not the right man. You need to be at home. God knows where you live. The home is the safest place for you. And I mean that with family. You're comfortable at home. You know your way around. That's a safe place. It's a place of refuge. Second place you need to be you need to be, the right place to be is at work. Yeah. Get a job. Go to work. Be productive. Be fruitful. If you can't find you at home, then he'll find you at work. By working, you tell him that you prize the stewardship of work. You depend upon God, yes, to supply all your needs. But you're telling him that you have skills. That you have a mind. You know how to use it. A Proverbs 31 woman wasn't about looks. In fact, the, the woman who wrote that said, who can, she's telling her son, son, you need to find a Proverbs 31 woman. But, but you know what, son? Who can find such a woman? Do they really exist? That's a mom saying that to her son. Mom saying, if you can find that one, grab her. Grab her quick. Because you'll know her because she's busy trying to better your life. She's helping you prosper. She's working hard. She's fruitful, productive. She's got brains. She's got, she's got abilities. She's got skills. She doesn't just sit around and wait on God. Well, I'm praying into my husband. Really? Well, maybe you got to be in the right place where he, maybe he can happen upon you. Not sit here folded, you know, on your knees. And, you know, there's a time to pray, Scripture says, and there's a time to do. That's what God said to Moses when it's time to cross the Reed Sea. He says, what are you doing praying? Get going! Amen. Get going! So at work, at home, thirdly, if you can't find you those two places, then maybe he might find you at the congregation. Maybe he might find you in fellowship. For if he's the right guy, he's going to be found praising the Lord. And I'm telling you something. This is very important you hear me. Being a believer is not enough. Being a believer is not enough. Because I promise you that if I walk out this door and confront anybody and say, do you believe in God? I'm, you're going to be hard pressed to find somebody who say, no, I don't. Everybody believes in God. Everybody, probably 85% of, of, of this country believes that they're Christians. According to George Barna and his research, 85% of America believes that they're Christians. Now, take that stat and go, how many of you are practicing your faith? 
you know where that number goes? 13%. 13%. Based upon time you read your Bible, fellowship you know, with other believers, church, prayer, all those things that are marks of a relationship with God. No, no. Being a believer is not, a, is not being a man or a faith. It's a doer of faith. A man who's about the Lord's business. If they're not about the Lord's business, move on. Move on. Amen. He ought to find you in the house of God because that's where you want to be found. In the house of God, lifting up holy hands, blessing Yeshua, praising Him. You ought to find you in, in praise and worship. You ought to see you at your congregation getting instructions for messages on your journey and your strength to endure temptations and the power to run and not be weary and the power to walk and not be faint. You had to find you in the Lord's house on the Lord's day. Amen. And what day is that? Thank you. You had to find you there during the week for Bateman Rosh, for dance class. If you are at the right place, God will bring you together. Genesis 29, 23, again, in the evening, he took Leah, his daughter, and brought her to Yaakov, and he went in and slept with her. That underscores the fact that God will bring you together. God brought Leah into Jacob. She didn't make that happen. She probably didn't have a clue what was going to happen. Just one more, come on. I got a guy for you. What? Unlike in a blink of an eye, she's married. She didn't have to date, court, look, see, find nothing. Just dad says, come on, here's your moment. And she's got a husband. It might be the right man, and you both might be in the right place, but you might not know each other. That you were destined to be together, but God, irregardless, will bring you together. You'll be sitting there going, well, I don't get this. He's not the kind of guy I normally go out with. He's not, he's not my type. He's not my style. He's not, he's not what I envision. He's not what I picture. He's not, you know. But in time, you find out, no, that's the one I was supposed to be with. He'll cause you to hook up. He'll cause you to meet. And God hooks up. Whatever he hooks up can't be broken up. Amen. Amen? For what God joins together, let no person dare to separate. Let no one separate him. God help you. You know what you know you know what coveting is about? You know, thou shalt not covet. It's, I'm gonna unpack that just for a second. We just think it's just about wanting something that somebody else has. That's coveting. We all you agree that's what coveting is? Yes. There's a dimension to it that we're missing. Actually, in the Hebrew, it doesn't mean just wanting something. It's plotting and planning to get it. That's what's evil. We all want something we can't have. Or haven't had yet. The evil about it is when we begin the process to try to get it. That's coveting. That's when it gets evil. God has hooked you up. Don't break it up. Amen? But... And let me just let me just addendum that a little bit. Um, some will say, well, well, God didn't hook us up. It was a mistake. No. When you bring God into the equation, God has brought you together. It's not like, you know, I don't think I did this right. I, don't, I, don't think, I, I, I think maybe I made a mistake. No. You brought God into the covenant equation, and so he has hooked you up, and no one should separate you. But let me tell you something. Most men don't want a woman who has inner strength and expectation to wait on God. Sadly, that's true. It really is true. I'm speaking about our gender and the fact that the majority of men that you're going to encounter, they have no patience for you waiting on the Lord. 
They don't. They're not the least bit interested in you waiting in the Lord. You think you're doing the right thing, the moral thing, the upright thing, the disciplined thing, the godly thing. You know what? And you think it should be appreciated, but the fact of the matter is, most men will not appreciate it. They will not appreciate it. No. Because they want you to act on impulse. They want you to act on emotion. They want you to go with the flow of the moment. They want her to be led by the lust, the flesh, and passion of the moment. They don't want you waiting on God. No, they don't. But you've got to get to the place where you can mix pain with your hope. And I know that oftentimes it's hard to praise God when nobody wants you. But the powerful thing about hope in the midst of pain is as long as you have expectation, you will trouble your circumstances. In other words, because nothing shakes up the way things are, like the expectation of things being better. And again, the law of contradiction applied. Mingle pain with joy. Mixing weeping with rejoicing. Mix evening with the morning because your expectation of the morning will trouble your circumstances in the night. And that's where we've got to go. You've got to get to the point where 